ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساعه من يدع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعصه ما فلا يضر الا نفسه فقال عز وجل يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه وقال عز وجل افلم ينظروا الى السماء فوقهم كيف بنيناها وزيناها وما لهم من فروج today inshallah i want to talk about two different topics and at the outset of what i'm going to talk about it may seem like that why am i talking about this and how is this relevant today but that's exactly the reason i'm talking about it is because i myself am trying to understand how it is relevant today so the first part of my khutbah is not so much of an answer but it is for it is a question for us to think about that how do these teachings relate to us today because i don't necessarily have clear answers so i will put them in front of you i will put the sayings of the prophet in front of you but i will give an introduction to the topic which is basically neighbors after the the post industrial times we have begun to more and more have neighborhoods and less and less of neighbors we have neighborhoods we live in neighborhoods and we always talk about a certain neighborhood and living in this neighborhood versus another neighborhood but a very important distinction of the modern times and post modern times for that matter is that the importance of neighborhood has increased while the importance of neighbors has almost completely diminished and because it has diminished so then we ask ourselves that what is the role of the neighbors what is the role of being in a neighborhood what is does it mean to be part of somebody's neighbor and so this is a question that i'm posing to all the muslims in this community to think about maybe we can come up with a new creative answer to the sayings of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it used to be that the neighborhood the masjid the local masjid you know also let me uh, share with you something that's interesting we muslims we definitely don't have any neighbors but the local people that have been living here they do and i'll share with you how you see after the industrial times what happened there was a major shift in the movement of people from the urban and rural areas to the cities the majority of us that have been living anywhere any house that we've been living to in any neighborhood that we've been living in we have been living in that neighborhood for less than 10 years majority of us majority of americans have been living in their particular neighborhood for the most part less than 10 years and in fact the the higher so if you're lower class you've been in your neighborhoods longer if you're middle class maybe not so long and if you are upper class you've been changing neighborhoods a lot more so how do people get to know their neighbors in the normal world that we live in and the way is for the average american he gets to know his neighbors by the churches you have your local church because many of you may not be informed of this but it is important to many americans if my neighborhood has a lutheran church or a protestant 
uh, you know, a Methodist church, or is there a church that I like, or a church or a denomination that I belong to? Is there a church from that, that's the one that I belong to near my neighborhood? And so, the point I'm trying to make is, is that majority of the Americans, they get to know their neighbors by their involvement in the churches. That's how they know them, because otherwise the majority of Americans have been in their neighborhoods for less than 10 years. It used to be in the Islamic civilization, now let me share with you something, that in the Islamic civilization, the neighborhood, the role it played, particularly through the local mosque, because just as, even if you look back home in Pakistan or Egypt, you get to know your neighbors how? You get to know your neighbors mostly by the local masjid you go to. You go to the masjid and all the neighbors are there and you get to talk to them. And The same thing with the church. But we don't have a local neighborhood church. We may have like a county uh, ministry of like a masjid. But we don't have a neighborhood anything. So if you're like in Egypt, you also get to know people. Or in the outer world also, you get to know your neighbors by the local masjid you go to mostly, especially to the men. So, in the Islamic civilization, prior to the industrial age where this major mass human shift took place from the rural areas to coming to the cities, the role that the masjid played, one of the roles that the masjid played in terms of a neighborhood, a lot of People are not aware of this, but it was part of the encouragement of the Prophet ﷺ. What Muslims used to do is that all volunteer work, like if you had extra food, for example, you, where would you announce that you have extra food? Where would you announce that I have some extra food if anyone wants in the neighborhood, come take it? You would go to your local masjid and say so. If a doctor, you know, just Actually, they have this tradition till today in Egypt where a doctor will give up one day of his year and he will do free work. So if there's, let's say, uh, you know, like, let's say 365 days in a year and uh, one doctor for one day says, okay, today I'm going to volunteer in this place. And the people, they come and they get free medicine and uh, they get free... Uh, checkups and so on and so forth. I mean, obviously, you can only do so much uh, in terms of not much beyond checkups and basic things. But a doctor would, for example, in the neighborhood give up maybe one day. I volunteer today. A lawyer or a scribe, somebody who writes down contracts, or somebody who would write down letters. He'd say, I'm going to do it for free today. And he goes to the local masjid, and then he does it for free. But the other advantage is this, or that used to happen in the Islamic civilization was that the masjid helped people stay connected. Not in the sense of we know each other. But there's a higher level of connection, which is, I know the cops, I know the firemen, I know the lawyers, I know the doctors. So if you have a neighborhood where people are generally coming, like they did 200 years ago or so in the Islamic civilization, everyone well, was well connected, not only through the local massages, but everyone was well connected because, also because they were well connected with their family members. Meaning, we nowadays, our family is just the simple unit of the mother and the father and the children, and maybe maximum a few brothers and, and then a few brothers and then, you know, and then a few children under the brothers. But that's, but it, it, you know, like the idea of the tribe. You know a few doctors, you know a few cops, you know a few, roofers, you know, a few, whatever. And so everybody would be well connected in the Islamic civilization in the sense that everyone knew someone for anything that they would generally need, have needs for. And then on top of that, you had your local masjid in which people were contributing, volunteering all the time for their neighborhoods. Now, this environment that Islam created and this is what I want you to understand. So the Prophet had said certain things about neighbors. Right? He said something, you can say, theoretical. He gave you a framework to think. Okay, think in this framework. And it resulted in neighborhoods functioning in a certain way. Not legally. No one was 
It wasn't fard that you have to come to the masjid and volunteer yourself. It wasn't legal. It wasn't a legal requirement, but it became almost cultural. It became part of the civilization. It became how we were as human beings functioning. So what I would like to do is I would like to put before you some of the sayings of the Prophet. And like I said, why am I doing this? Why am I talking about neighbors? If we live in a time where we have neighborhoods, but we don't really have neighbors. I'm doing this for that very reason, is that I'm asking myself and the audience, which is you, that explain to me how does this translate into today's world? We knew how it translated, or they were able to translate these things of the Prophet at that time into how they understood their world. But how do we take these sayings of the Prophet that I will share with you and translate it into today's world and how does it functionally work in today's world? And so I'm going to begin with some of the sayings of the Prophet ﷺ regarding neighbors. So you get an idea. I'm going to mention a few sayings of the Prophet. So you get an idea of this, the importance of the neighbor in Islam. And I want you on the one side to keep this discussion that I had, that I just had about we have neighborhoods but no neighbors and, and how Islamic civilization translated the teachings of the Prophet practically into what I was just mentioning. But there's another side that I want you to keep in mind, and that is that one of the motifs, motif means one of the sayings, one of the examples, one of the motifs of Christianity is the motif of love thy neighbor. You all probably heard of this uh, motif, the very idea of love thy neighbor. But one thing I want you to consider is that everyone has the idea of love thy neighbor. But I want you to see how Islam was able to translate that from an idea to something practical. From the time of the Prophet Sallallahu to something that was concrete and practical. So that's why I'm going to go over some sayings of the Prophet Sallallahu And then inshallah uh, we will uh, go over another some verses of the Quran in, in, in another topic. But I just wanted to start with this. قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ما زال جبريل يوصيني بالجار حتى ظننت أنه سيورثه. Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم said that Jibreel would advise me regarding the neighbor so much, so much, so much, so much. He'd keep telling me, keep telling me. And there's so many riwayas of this saying of the Prophet in, from so many different directions. That the Prophet said he would keep advising me, Jibreel would keep advising me about the rights of the, your neighbor, rights of your neighbor that I would think, the Prophet would say that I thought maybe he will also have right of inheritance, like, an, like basically as a family member. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْيَحْسَنْ إِلَىٰ جَارِهِ Whoever believes in Allah and in the Day of Judgment, let him be good with his neighbor. And whoever believes in Allah in the last day, let him honor his guest. The saying of the Prophet continues, but I'm just trying to quickly go over some sayings. The Prophet ﷺ said, the Prophet had a Jewish neighbor. And you know, it used to be in Islamic civilization, we, we talk, this is not zakat. This is not, uh, we're not talking about zakat, we're talking about the idea of volunteerism, the idea of volunteering. And so, especially there is a lot of emphasis about giving food, for example. You also find, for example, in Quran, يَمْنَعُونَ الْمَعُونَ Those, who, small, those who, who stop people from small kindnesses. Used to be in, the, in those days that if you needed salt, for example, or if you needed, let's say, just as an example, some extra cash to pay the pizza guy because you don't have change or something. You go to your neighbor and get the money and, and, and give the salt or give the cash. And I'm, I'm sure the adults here have an idea of how that used to be. Anyway, <coughs> the, um, the Prophet had a Jewish neighbor, so the Prophet had given something to be distributed in his neighborhood. And then the Prophet said, a hadith 
Did you give the gift to our Jewish neighbor? And the Prophet kept asking this till he got the answer. Meaning the Prophet made no distinction between Muslim and non-Muslims when it came to his neighbor when it, when it came to his neighborhood, particularly keeping in mind the atmosphere that was in Medina, particularly in regards to the uh, Jewish community that specifically lived in Medina. By the way, this book that I'm reading from is called Adab al Mufrat. Everyone should have this book. This is a book written by Imam Bukhari. Bukhari is different. We call Sahih Bukhari, that's the big book. This is called Adab al Mufrat. The Manners of the Individual, basically, is the translation. Everyone should have this hadith book, including if I'm now mentioning this topic. Every Muslim should read Adab al Mufrat. Every Muslim should read Riyadh al Salihin, which is. Uh, the guard, translated as gardens of the righteousness, sayings of the Prophet Every Muslim should have Mishkat and Masabih, which is about three large volumes. These are like, this is not advanced Islamic studies. This is basic, basic. What I'm reading right, right now, obviously, many of you have already heard of this. This is basic, basic, basic. The ABCs of Islam, yeah, I mean, uh, ABCs of Islam. Uh, these three books of Hadith, Adab uh, al Riyadh al-Salihin, Mashkat al So, uh, if you want the masjid to buy them, and you buy them from us, at, of course, no cost, I can take care of that too. Um, but anyway, since I was reading from here, I thought uh, it's always good to introduce a book that you're using as a source to, uh, to convey a message. The Prophet ﷺ, in describing what is the concept, and in, especially in the Maliki fiqh, in the Maliki school of law, this is a very important framework, what I'm about to say from this saying of the Prophet ﷺ. Not so much in the other, the other fuqaha have not so much as defined it in this way, but Imam Malik uses this hadith to actually define what is considered a neighborhood. So, whereas the others haven't used this to like give it a specific definition as such. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, Su'ila anja, the Prophet ﷺ was asked about neighbors, so he said, Arba'ina daran imamuhu, 40 houses that are in front of you. Wa arba'in khalfa, and 40 that are behind. Wa arba'in anil yameen, and 40 that are to the right. Wa arba'in anil shimal. So you can think in today's world that's equal to approximately, and, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm just thinking one block means 10 houses. So you can say four blocks this way, four blocks this way, four blocks this way, four blocks that way. That is considered a neighborhood. And the idea is, like I said, especially in the Maliki Fiqa, is that for every 40, 120 houses, uh, around about for every 120 houses, there should be one small uh, masjid where the people come together five times a day. So basically, by not... What Imam Malik and the Mal Maliki Fiqh and some of the other scholars, what they do is, in order to make sure you don't have too many massages, so this is like the lim the delimiting factor that uh, you have in, in for every 40 houses this way, 40 houses this way, 40 houses this way, 40 houses this way, you have one small masjid. And you know, Jum'ah is not done in those masjids. The Jum'ah is done in the masjid in downtown, so to say, or the big Jamia masjid, where everybody from the small neighborhood goes to the bigger place to pray over there. So that's how it used to be. Obviously, we don't, cannot, it's not practical to be doing that. Uh, but I'm just explaining to you the uh, this saying of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا يبدأ بجاري أقصى. Don't start giving your extra things that you have. You know, يسألونك ماذا ينفقون قل الأف. They ask you, oh, this is the ayah of the Quran, this is the Quran. They ask you, O oh, Prophet, what should we give in the cause of Allah? Kul ilaf. Whatever extra you have, give it. This was the idea. So the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يبدأ بجاره أقصى Don't begin with the farthest neighbor. But, uh, but, قبل uh, أدنى Before you start with the nearest, uh, the one that's near you. So you start with your nearest neighbors and then you go and give the gifts. And it used to be in the Islamic civilization that a household would give something, let's say some dish or some extra food, and they would give it to their neighbor and they would say, we don't need it. And they would give it to their neighbor and they would give it to their neighbor. 
until by the end of the evening, it would come back to the house that had originally uh, had given that gift. So that was the type of environment that Islam had created just in the lo local neighborhood. Let me also read. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا يؤمن الذي يشبع That person is not a believer, the Prophet says. Who is full? He is full. وَجَاهُ جَاهِ And his neighbor is in jur, is in starvation. I'm going to finish these off quickly so I can go on to the next topic. The Prophet ﷺ he said, Ya Abu Dhar, O oh Abu Dhar, who is a companion of the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Abu Dhar, Ida Tabakta, when you cook something, Ida Tabakta, Marraqatan, uh, you know, a curry or a sauce, or when you make something and you have a lot of it, I, instead of reading the Arabic, I'll just translate quickly. When you have a lot of it, then even if you have to put water into it so then you can give it something to your neighbors that need, need it. Okay? The Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Rasulullah, inna fulanan taqumun layl. There's somebody, he, this person stands up at night, wa taqumun nahar, and he fasts in the daytime, and wa tasaddaq, and gives in the cause of Allah, wa yu'zi jauna, and gives pain to our neighbor. The Prophet was asked about this. La khayra fiha. The Prophet, there's no good in this. And then another example was given, of course, the opposite of that, and the Prophet says, yes, this is what is the idea is. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that person will not enter Jannah who's not, his neighbors are not safe from him. The Prophet said, Ya Nisa al Muslimat, O oh, Muslim women, La tahrikanna jara. Don't uh, belittle if your neighbor asks you of low fashion shah. Even if your neighbor asks you of the shoe, of the goat, or the sheep, don't say no. Don't say no for no reason. I think I'll end here with this topic. But the point I'm trying to make is, these were the teachings of Islam. This is what the Prophet ﷺ said. And it translated into neighborhoods that were coming to the masjid, were doing volunteerism, they were helping each other with food, they were helping each other with other services. It was a place where people were getting connected. But we live in times, again, where we don't have neighbors. We're not. The, one of the reasons that we're not so well connected is that, you know, when people go to the church, for example, people go to their local church, they get to know people not just as their neighbors, but they get to know them in terms of their professions. This is a doctor, this is the, this person works in the, uh, in the city hall, this person is a fireman, this person is doing such and such services, this person, and that allows, you know, there's a big debate right now about local businesses versus big corporations. I'm not going to go into that right now. But do you know how many businesses Best Buy, for example, put out of business? You know, uh, because I'm not going to go into that right now. But uh, the point I'm trying to make is simply the cohesion of the, of the neighbors because you get to know people. When you come to a church, for example, you get to know people. But you don't have that ability. We come maybe once a year once a week, and even that, on a work day, on Friday, where we don't get to mingle, we don't get to know each other, we don't, you know what happens? Let me explain something to you. When people go to a church, you know what people do after they go to church? It is a very common tradition in America, across the board. As soon as people are done from the church, they go and eat together. They go to a local restaurant. They'll go to TGIF, or they'll go to, um, some famous place and they'll eat together. Maybe some of you have seen this. That after they go to the church on Sunday, the next thing that they do is then they'll go out and eat and they'll chit chat and get to know each other. Now, does how does a neighborhood translate today for us? Is the neighborhood for us, us? 
because we are our own network, we are the local network? Or does the neighbor translate into the people that live by us, or both? And if, the, if it translates into the people by us, how do we become neighborly to them? How do we show, on Eid day, do we, on Eid, do we give them some sort of hadiyah because they're our neighbors? Do we share our food with them? Do we share our culture with them? How do we become more neighborly to our neighbors? So this is some questions that I have been asking myself and don't necessarily have answers. And I'm asking you, and if you have some bright ideas or some good answers, then I would like you to share them with me and I would like to think about uh, this topic more. But definitely, it is the local masjid for sure, that acts as our kind of like neighborhood. This is like our neighborhood. This masjid or any other masjid for that matter, it doesn't matter. We we are our own neighborhood in a way because we are the local, local neighborhood masjid. This one or any other that's a local neighborhood masjid. So how do we become more neighborly to each other? How do we work as neighbors to each other? Uh, how do we bond together? Um, so these are questions I want you to ask yourselves. Uh, you know, does it come to your mind that, how often does it come to your mind, oh, I know that Muslim brother, he's a, he's a plumber, or he's a Muslim brother and he'll do this. And it's not always, you know, Muslim brothers, we always think, oh, because I know someone, it has to be cheaper. Why not the opposite? If it's, if it's a Muslim brother you know, it should be more expensive, you should be giving it more, because then that money comes back to the community too, in the end of the day. So, anyway, uh, I will uh, start say something different in the second khutbah. أقول قولي هذا أستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين والمسلمات. Please come forward. Can everyone move forward because there are people coming. إن الحمد لله نحمده نستعينه نستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أفلم ينظروا إلى السماء فوقهم كيف بنيناها وزيناها وما له من فروج رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي آمين يا رب I want to share with you something, and I'm going to try to say this very quickly, because time is running out. Translating the verse that I'm going to talk about, Allah says, أَفَلَمْ يَنْظُرُوا Nazar means to observe in, in the Arabic language, because there are many words to see. Ra'a means to see. أَفَلَمْ أَلَمْ تَرَى Did you not see, for example. Nazar means to observe something. Okay. أَفَلَمْ يَنْذُرُوا إِلَى السَّمَاءِ Did you not see the sky? كَيْفَ بَنَيْنَاهَا How we constructed it. وَزَيَّنَّاهَا And we made it beautiful. وَمَا لَهُ مِنْ فُرُوجِ And it has no flaws. This is a verse in the Quran. Uh, just a few reflections about this particular verse. I mean, I have a lot to say, but I'm just going to limit myself to a few points. You know, whenever you make something, there are two aspects. One is the design aspect how you design it. So if you want to make a, if you want to make the fastest car, you're not going to just engineer the fastest car. You're going to want to make the fastest car, and then you're going to want to make a design that goes with that fastest car. Both components have to be there, the construction of something, and then the aesthetics of something, right? So there has to be the, the making of something, and then the aesthetics of something. So why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this because one of the points Qur'an makes, which I will share with you, is that Qur'an says over and over again, over and over again, this idea that, you know, because a lot of times we live in an age where people deny God, and so this is one thing that I wanted to share with you. Two things, two, three things. Number one thing I want to share with you. If you get it, you get it. I hope, inshallah, I'll be able to explain it quickly. What are the chances 
what are the chances? Because there's three types of logic, by the way. And uh, okay, I won't go into that right now. What are the chances that we get knowledge? How do we get knowledge? We get knowledge through our eyes, through our hearing, through our brains, right? Our five senses is the medium through which we attain information and perceive information. Our five senses is how we know things. If this world was just by chance, if this world was just a improbability, perfect accident, a perfect accident that was very improbable, but it happened. But in that accident in which this world was improbable, but just happened to happen, what were the chances then that we would also have all the senses we need to actually educate ourselves for that world? Meaning, okay, the universe happened. And let's say organic, we went from non-living to living, and then we went, just everything happened automatically. But then what are the chances that the, the human being, the thing that's at the climax of the evolutionary process, if you may say, that that human being then has all the tools it needs to actually know and understand and to observe and to have ideas of that universe in which that person lives Meaning, if there was no God, and everything was just random, and everything was just happening by chance, okay, maybe a universe, some, some entity came into existence. Maybe, okay, something from non-living went to some sort of living. But then the idea that it went from there to creating a being that has knowledge, and can perceive knowledge, and can understand knowledge, and his knowledge is essentially in infinite, defined by the very definition of infinite if you understand it to be x plus 1 continuously since our knowledge can be x plus 1 continuously therefore technically our knowledge is infinite in that sense anyway the point i'm trying to make is that what would there be probabilities that we then have the senses we need to actually observe this universe if this universe was an accident this is the first point second point this is the point that quran makes not only did we give you all you know in the sama wal basara wal fuad as the Quranic terminology, the seeing and the hearing and your understanding, because seeing is how you observe, and sama is how you hear, and then you have your data, your observation of that information. Then, on top of that, Allah says, look, but not only did just I create this universe for you, 